Welcome to Short Course, episode 111, for September 29th, 2023. I'm your host, Ben Barry. This is the second week where I want to talk about the things that went well and lessons learned from the 2023 Carolina Classic. This week, in particular, we'll be talking about the nuts and bolts of running Chrono at the match. So this was the second year that I ran Chrono, and last year we definitely learned a ton. Things, for the most part, went well. Uh, and so this year was about sort of taking those lessons and putting them into action and, and trying to improve things further where we could. To start with, one thing that I pushed for last year that got shot down is the idea that, in my personal opinion, I think it would actually be better if we didn't chrono every single competitor, but that we had some kind of random chrono process where on any given stage, at the end of it, you could be asked for eight rounds and then told, hey, you got to go chrono these rounds before the end of the match or you shoot for no score. However, the way the rules are written currently, it specifies that every competitor must be chronoed. And in my opinion, it just isn't really logistically feasible to to do both. To When I emailed Troy about this last year, he was saying, well, you're, you're welcome to randomly resample people at any time. And it's like, yeah, that's true. But logistically, it this last year we were especially understaffed this year we had we had adequate staffing levels but just logistically it wasn't really worth it to to be trying to go grab people and drive them on a golf cart so what i think we've settled on is a reasonable compromise in the sense that what we do is we have run chrono back to back with a small stage uh, in this case it was a, a 13 round well i guess technically it would be a medium course by that definition but it was a it was a pretty quick stage and what we do is we have the the RO who's running the timer for each shooter on that stage. When they unload the shooter, but before they call range is clear, they just say, hey, I need eight rounds put in this bag. And my recommendation to the squad, I didn't actually end up getting a chance to go over to the other side of the concrete wall where, they're, where they were doing it and see exactly what they were doing. But my recommendation to them and, and my recommendation to you, if you're going to put this into action, is to basically alternate between asking for eight rounds out of the magazine they used or magazines that they used during the stage and just randomly pointing to a mag on their belt and saying, I want eight rounds out of that one. Why is this? You might have a mag of chrono ammo, maybe, you know, extra hot stuff, but are you going to put all those bullets in every magazine on your belt? Probably not. If people wanted to get around this, how would they do it? Well, then maybe they know that they only step up to the line on the stage right before chrono with mags that they know they've loaded with chrono ammo. This is getting pretty far down the cat and mouse game rabbit hole. So I think this is the the goal in 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 what I'm doing here is to try and make measures that are reasonably difficult to circumvent while also being reasonably easy to implement. And so to me, you know, just pointing to a mag on the competitor's belt and saying, "Hey, let me get 8 rounds out of that one." It, it's it's a nice balance. Uh, I don't know if they were actually doing that. They may have just been every time asking for 8 rounds out of the mag they used in the gun, which again, it was still a 13 round stage, unloaded start. You know, if you've got a, are you going to bring a hundred rounds of chrono ammo if you really wanted to, to be sure? I don't know. I, spoiler alert, there was only one guy who came anywhere close to having issues with, with chrono and it was not because he was cheating. Now, is that because people know that we run a pretty tight ship on chrono at this match? I, who knows? I can't say, but I do take pride in the fact that I would hope by now people know that if they're going to come shoot this match, they need to have their stuff squared away. But anyway, the the shooter or the, the RO gets those eight rounds from the shooter and puts them in these little plastic bags. They're called cash transmittal bags. And I believe based on you know what's written on them, they're basically used for retail stores at the end of the day to be able to put cash in them. And they, they have a little self-adhesive strip. And basically, there's no way to get into the bag without ripping it. And so the idea is once the bag is closed, the RO can hand the, the competitor that bag and say, go to Chrono with these rounds. And if they show up with a bag that's ripped, that's a huge red flag. But there's no way, basically, they can't go to their, you know, on the way over to Chrono, they can't stop by their range bag and swap the eight rounds for something else the way they could if it were just eight rounds in a Ziploc. Again, this is just kind of thinking through the cat and mouse game where if I did want to cheat this system, how would I do it? And so these cash transmittal bags, they're real cheap. I mean, you buy them by the hundreds or a couple hundred packs, something like that. So it's a it, it's a minor cost, and it actually ends up being a, a somewhat convenient thing because we can just put the bullets that we don't use from the competitor, we can give them back to them in that 
in that bag. And that's a way they can kind of carry it away instead of having to try and hold everything in, in their hands. So that works pretty well. You just have the RO gather that ammo before he calls range is clear. So the whole range is kind of frozen and the competitors, you know, in a hurry to, okay, let me, let me give you these eight rounds and then we'll go and score the targets and, and, and get on with it. So I think collecting ammo in, in that way, if you're not going to do it in, in some kind of truly random sub sample way where you're not actually checking every competitor at a known time, but instead if the rules were, you know, amended to allow some kind of true random, which they're not, then I think this is probably the best compromise that, that I've seen so far. Not saying it can't be improved, but I'd love to hear about it if you think you got a better a better scheme. And it's worth contrasting this with the way it's been at most big matches with Nationals the last few times I've gone. Now, the last time I went to Nationals was the spring of 2021, but from what I've heard, it, it still works this way where you just show up to your first stage and you're given a Ziploc bag and told, hey, put your name on this card or write your name on the bag or whatever it is and put eight rounds in this bag from, you know, presumably wherever you want. And those bags get turned into the stage RO, and then somebody comes around and takes all those bags to Chrono. One of the reasons that they do it this way is that at Nationals and at big matches, as far as I know, the typical way of pulling the bullet to weigh it to determine what your velocities measured by a chronograph, what those should be multiplied by to determine your power factor, the way they pull those bullets is using those those hammer pullers where you actually screw the bullet into the back of a thing that you know looks like a plastic hammer and then you whack it against a block of wood or a piece of concrete or something until it shakes the bullet loose. And the downside of those things is they're slow, they break, they basically have a service life of a few hundred maybe, and so you need to have spares if you're going to use them, and they're just tedious to use. It's, it's fine if you're doing something on a small scale where you only need to pull a few bullets. But to me, there are there are much better approaches to this. And so one of the things that was sort of a linchpin of when we said we wanted to go to doing Chrono this way, where we collect the ammo right before the shooter comes to Chrono, is that implies that you need a way to pull the bullet quickly and not in a, a way that is going to necessarily fatigue your staff and have you running through these, these hammer pullers. And so last year... We experimented with using the RCBS collet puller, which has individual collets for each caliber. And so in this case, we just keep one for 9, 40, and 45, and the, the matching shell plate. Last year, we had a Lee single stage press that we mounted this die in. And the the main sort of nice to have would be the idea of having a second one where you leave one set up for 9, one set up for 40, and when you get the occasional 45 come through, you can just swap one of them over. The The process to change the collets is pretty quick. Once you know what you're doing, you basically just hold it with one hand and spin the lever with the other hand. And so it was not an issue. Although last year, I know Stephanie Barry, my wife, and John Royer, who were the two who were kind of tag teaming as they had availability as my assistant at Chrono last year, again, because we had some folks drop out last minute, leaving us a little bit understaffed last year. I know for them, sometimes they prefer just a, if it was a 45 or something, just throw it in the hammer puller and, and pull it that way. This year, I, I was the one doing the bullet pulling and, and all of that side of things. And it was, I had two assistants over the course of the weekend. They were the ones doing the actual shooting of, of the guns, which is what I was doing last year. So I got to kind of sit in the left seat instead of the right seat this time. And for me, knowing how the, how the, the collets worked, just being able to spin out one and, and put the other one in quickly. I found easier. And I mean, one thing worth noting is apparently the RCBS one is better than the other ones out there. I had people talking about Hornady makes one that works on a similar collet bullet pulling system. And I think there was some third one that somebody mentioned to me and the, the ones that weren't the RCBS one people were complaining about or saying it'll ding up the bullet. But this, this RCBS one, I mean, it just worked. I, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. I actually got one for personal use and I just put it in my, my 650 and once a year or so now I'll just go through and all the, all the bad rounds I've loaded over the year, I'll just, I'll just pull them. And even in a progressive press, you just hand load one at a time and it's, yeah, it, it goes super quick. It, I'm definitely a fan. It's, it's a good piece of kit, but so we had this year, we had those two presses. We also, so last year we had a, a little stand on the range that we were able to screw the, the press into because it was sort of a last minute addition. 
this year we thought, okay, we want something that's reliable that we can set up at home. If we go to another range in the future, we, we can take it with us. And originally I was going to build something out of lumber that could be taken apart for storage because everything, all, all of this equipment has to live in our garage for the other 51 weeks out of the year that we're not hosting the NC section match. And, you know, potentially if someone else were to be section coordinator, we would hand all this gear off and we don't necessarily want someone to have to store some big bulky solution. And uh, then I remembered something that I actually used to load on my very first reloading press back when I was living in an apartment and I, I couldn't leave it set up all the time. And it's this Black & Decker Workmate folding workbench. It kind of folds out almost like a TV tray and it just has a little a little wood worktop. And we got one of those and mounted both of these two presses to it. And it works great. You can take it apart. You can take the presses off. They'll, they store in a box. This little thing folds up relatively flat and that's a pretty good setup i thought we were done and then i got to thinking and someone was was talking about this other bullet pulling device that frankfurt arsenal makes which they call it the pile driver and it's kind of hard to really explain just if you're curious just google frankfurt arsenal pile driver but the best way i can explain it is that it, it works on the same principle as the hammer pullers except that it uses a spring-loaded mechanism that you cock back with a handle and then it accelerates the bullet in this carriage. It's held in by the, the base of the bullet, much like the hammer pullers do, and it's in this carriage and then the springs slam the bullet forward in a sort of linear motion, whereas, you know, if you imagine swinging a hammer, it's more of a circular motion, but this thing, it, it basically works on the same idea. So you're not grabbing the bullet with a collet, you're grabbing the casing by its rim and then you're accelerating the whole thing and basically trying to drive the bullet out through inertia. And I thought, okay, this is going to be the most overkill possible setup. But I, I, I talked to Steph. She's like, yeah, we filled the match. We've got a little bit of money. We can afford it. So we ended up having these two presses mounted to this little portable workbench. And then the pile driver got mounted sort of on the, the backside of it. So when the thing was all done up, it was it was quite the little command center of, of equipment. And the good news is that part of it, worked without issue there were i didn't i wasn't keeping strict track but in my mind it was about 10 there were about 10 bullets that i wasn't able to pull with the collet puller and what i found particularly interesting is these i did end up so I, i'd try and get a grip on them with the the appropriate caliber collet puller i wouldn't be able to to get a good grip so i'd take it i'd pop it into this this pile driver mechanism crank it run it a few times because just like swinging the hammer, sometimes it, it takes more than one, especially with these really tightly crimped bullets. And there were some of them where it would, even after two or three pulls run through this, this pile driver thing, the bullet still wouldn't come out, but I would look at it and it would have come, it would have worked its way out of the, the casing far enough that I could easily get a, get a good grip on it with a collet puller in that, at that point. And so that was nice because I would say the one, the one thing that's somewhat annoying about the, the pile driver is, because of the way it inertially works, it kind of throws the powder everywhere. Whereas with the collet puller, if you imagine you're, you're putting the case in this little single stage press, raising the bullet up into a, into a single stage die, tightening the collet around it, and then lowering the case down and the bullet stays up in the die and the case comes down with the powder and the primer in the case, it doesn't really go anywhere. And so I was able to just kind of dump it out either into a, you know, into a trash can or a, a cup or some kind of receptacle. So the powder wasn't just kind of flying everywhere. Very minor improvement, but it was nice. And so in, uh, I would say to my memory, it was about eight out of those 10 cases. The pile driver ended up working the bullet loose enough that I then pulled it with the collet puller. And there were only, I think two, maybe three times where the, the pile driver actually just got it out with, uh, on, on its own. But between that whole setup, there was, there were no issues. Every bullet was able to be pulled without marring them. And honestly, I think it was, I think it was pretty slick. Is it something that you could necessarily afford if you were starting uh, a new match? Probably not. I mean, the one nice thing about those hammer pullers is they are pretty darn cheap. But especially for a match like this where we've been going for a few years and we have some money left from previous years. And this year there was there was a decent money amount of money generated by the match actually filling up that, uh, that we were able to invest in some hardware like this. And now the section owns it until the end of time. So it'll be hopefully useful for many, many years to come. So that was the, the bullet pulling side of things. So basically what would happen is the, the shooter would come up, they'd hand the, the bag of bullets to me, and then the, the RO who I was working with 
uh, who's actually doing the the chronoing and, and shooting of the guns would give them the appropriate range commands to set their gun on the mat and give them a, a an unloaded magazine. As I talked about not too many episodes ago, there there was a little bit of kerfluffle last year around the fact that I thought it was not appropriate to use make ready as a as a range command at at the the chrono. And this year I decided it wasn't worth standing on principle on that. We would just give the shooter a range command that included make ready. This was nice for the folks who've been to nationals because that's basically how they run it at, at nationals. But there definitely were some folks who were confused, especially on, on staff day when folks were coming through chrono, uh, a couple of people, when they got the make ready, they loaded the gun and set it on the mat, which is not a DQ or anything. They've been given a, a make ready command, but it was definitely one of those where, uh, that's, that's not really what we meant. And so the range command that we ended up settling on was make ready by setting your unloaded gun on the mat. And there was a little you know, padded mat in the middle of the table that, that was clear where the gun was supposed to go. And once we once we got to that, most people, if they'd been in nationals, once they heard make ready, they were fine. And most folks, if this was their first level two, uh, first experience at a level two chrono in particular, which apparently a lot of level twos are just skipping chrono this uh, these days, which, I mean, it's kind of disappointing to me, but I can't really necessarily blame them. But... Uh, for folks where this was their first time going to a level two, a, a chrono at a level two, that that command was sort of self-descriptive enough. There were a few people who basically said, like, do you want it locked open or do you want me to load it? And then you could just kind of answer that question. And and that that seemed to work pretty well. The other thing that that came out of the discussion on the, the podcast most recently about where I was talking about those chrono range commands, somebody made a, a really good point, I thought, which was last year I was of the mind that it didn't make sense for me to tell a shooter to unload and show clear. I know the gun's clear because I just cleared it. And the point was made that that's sort of asking them to trust you, which is one of the things that that we learn not to do when handling firearms, right? The first rule of firearm safety is every gun is always loaded. And what's implied is when a gun comes into your possession from someone else handling it, you make sure it's unloaded. You don't just trust them. And to make it really specific, the person who was making this point asked the hypothetical of, well, if somebody goes to their next stage and goes to make ready and there's a round loaded in the chamber, can they be DQ'd for that? If it was your fault that you left it in the chamber because you didn't clear the gun correctly, maybe you got mixed up and you told them to holster handgun and you just told them not to to show clear. And I thought, okay, nope, you're right. That's a, that's a good point. I should show the competitor respect by... It's, it's not so much that I need to be shown the gun is unloaded. It's more of a, okay, let's all agree that this gun is unloaded. And from here on out, if it shows up unloaded or if it shows up loaded, then it's on you. So that that made a lot of sense on the, the unload and show clear side of things as well. So we ended up just sort of following those those range commands more or less as as dictated with, again, that, that extra kind of context that I mentioned about specifically saying set your gun unloaded on the mat where the, the chrono appendix just says, you know, give the shooter the make ready command and basically assume they know what to do. So at that point, you know, once the shooter had come up, giving me the bag of ammo, I would, I would slice it open, set a couple, the take one bullet to pull and set the other bullets on the mat. So the, the, the right seater could load the mag once they were ready, the person in the right seat would take the gun. And then we had a little checklist of per division, what things needed to be checked, which was really nice because Sometimes the shooters would banter with you or there would be some kind of confusion. And so it was nice just being able to get back to the checklist and, and go right down it. And we had all nine divisions on, on one sheet of paper that just sat in front of you. And, uh, you know, because there's a there's actually IPSC has a handgun equipment checklist book manual, but it's one page per division. So you'd be sort of flipping through the pages if you were to print this whole thing out. But it is it is nice that it says for this division here are basically the steps you should follow here are the things you should check and then the first page is basically here's all the stuff you should check for every division, so having it sort of reformatted into more of this kind of single page format definitely helped and obviously this was an unofficial resource that that I wrote but I think it was I think it's it was it was helpful in terms of just keeping things efficient and and keeping shooters turned around as fast as they could send them to us, so the person in the right seat would go down this list, you know, make sure, for example, the thumb safety on any gun that had a thumb safety worked. We didn't have any issues with that this year, but there was one guy last year who had a shadow two that had been gunsmithed all to heck and the thumb safety on it no longer worked. He was shooting in carry optics, so he was never starting cocked and locked, but the rules say if it's got the safety, it's got to be functional. So 
Uh, he had to go to his backup gun, which was ended up being fine, but we didn't have any issues like that this year. No trigger safeties, no grip safeties that were disabled when they shouldn't be. Obviously, there are some divisions where you can, some divisions where you can't. That was all noted on this sheet. And then once the the gun was checked, we had the bullet pulled. I'd have the, the tablet, and I'd call out that I was ready for velocities, and the, the, the guy sitting in the right seat would load up a mag with three rounds. And our chrono setup was a dual lab radar setup, which, I mean, is is certainly the most generous you can be to competitors. It is You're not going to get a, a more favorable reading from, from any other scenario. Although I will say if you're, as a match director, if you're considering buying two light-based chronos and using them as a, some kind of dual chrono setup in a chrono coffin, to me, the, the lab radar after two years, once you get the hang of it, is so reliable that, to my mind, it is as good as a dual chrono, a dual light-based chrono setup. And honestly, we had the the second one there. Just uh, well, at first we had uh, we'd borrowed uh, Nathan Carter from Shooting Sports Innovations. He'd lent us his. It had some some issue with a corrupted SD card, and so it ended up going down. And wouldn't you know it, Range Master Gary McConnell had his in his car. So we actually had three lab radars on the range, and we ended up you know using uh, using two of them. But even if we'd only had one, I the it was so rare that a shot would register on one but not the other that. They, I really, it's nice to have, but if you're looking at running a chrono, I think having a single lab radar is a perfectly competent setup. Now, a few notes about how to run the the chrono. So, one thing that we found last year was PCCs in particular, depending on the the style of the muzzle brake, ones that that especially don't have any ports on the side and only have have vents upward. You want the muzzle brake. So, the, the way the lab radar works, you. It, it calibrates, you tell it how far the gun is away from the lab radar. And so typically you have it set to a setting. It, it can say six, 12 or 18 inches. You have it set to six inches and then you basically set the lab radars about a foot apart so that when the gun's in the middle of the two of them, it's six inches away from each one. In practice with the PCCs, most of them, you want to get the gun like two inches away from one of the chronos. Cause if you put it right in the middle of both of them, neither will end up picking up the shot. And so what we found is with with most of the PCCs, especially ones with the the upward facing muzzle brakes, the best bet was you just get it right, you know, about 2 inches away from one of the chronos, a little low and a, you know, kind of angle the brake towards the towards the side of the lab radar or where the microphone is on the inside of the, the the casing and it'll pick it up every single time. No issues with that. And so for most of the PCCs, we were only getting a reading on one of the chronos anyway, just because of the way that the sensitivity was set up. The thing that really bedeviled us this time, which I thought was interesting, was open guns. And for whatever reason, when I was shooting last year, I I guess I intuitively just was not sticking the guns far enough forward to to cause the issue. But this year, we the first day in particular on Saturday morning, we were just having the worst time getting open major guns to to chrono. We were getting crazy readings, like four thousand feet per second on one, and then the other one wouldn't pick it up at all. And if you read the manual and look at their their videos, Lab Radar says that for really like blasty rifle comps, you actually want the the comp past the the Lab Radar so that so that the blast is kind of slightly behind uh, the 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 Chrono isn't getting hit by the blast; it's kind of going slightly down range of them. And so we tried that. We tried having the the open guns kind of dead even with the with the Lab Radars, which is what we're doing with most other guns. Still wasn't reading right. And I think it was all just based on echoes and and this one particular bay. It's an interesting bay because it's about 10 feet wide. It's a very narrow bay. We couldn't set up a stage there, but it's perfect for chrono. But it's got a concrete wall on one side. And so we were getting a lot of reflection of sound from that. But again, last year, we didn't really have too many issues. But this year, we just could not get it to work. And uh, Gary was actually telling us that apparently for Area 6, when they were here, uh, they had exactly the same issue on this bay. And from what he said, they, they never did figure it out. Now, I will say, luckily, uh, Sam Caldwell, who was the guy working with me on Saturday, he is friends with Lauren from MPA, who had an open gun at their demo booth at the top of the hill. And so he just texted her and was like, hey, can you bring your open gun down here with a couple mags of ammo so we can just figure this chrono issue out? And she was like, sure, I'll be right there. Grab the gun, grab some mags, hop to golf cart, ride down. And we basically just, <laughs> we basically just tried everything. And we we're, you know, high, low, further back, further downrange. And what we found out was 
somewhat counterintuitively, and this is this must be what I was doing last year without really being aware of it, was actually being a little bit back from the chrono, about six inches back from, you know, all the way at the, the, the end of the comp being six inches behind the lab radar. Once we did that, both of them were picking up every shot from these open major guns, no problem. But if we had the, the end of the comp flush with the the lab radars or past them, they it was just chaos and pandemonium. So thanks to, to MPA for helping us figure that out. Uh, it was, you know, w- once we were able to kind of experiment and just try stuff and not not have a competitor right staring right there like, hey, why can't you get your, your stuff to work? Uh, it was it was fairly simple to, to figure it out. I think it took us 20 rounds maybe to to, to work it out. But yeah, thanks to them for for that. And again, I you know it's one of those things where it was, was we were scratching our heads because it wasn't an issue last year, but we got it figured out. We did end up having four open major competitors that Saturday morning, where we fired all seven rounds. We pulled one bullet, we fired the other seven, and we could not get a single velocity for them. And the the way you know Chrono works, if we can't prove you know if we can't get an accurate velocity, then we take your power factor as declared. And so those guys shot for major. I mean. They, they certainly were loud enough and, you know, the, the guns were kicking enough. So I, I, I wasn't, there wasn't really a ton of doubt about that, but they, uh, they got to shoot with major and they, you know, they, they got a pass and then everybody else, once we figured this issue out, we were able to get two velocities on, on each shot, no problem. And so we were going three for three on, uh, on the open major guns once, once that was all, all resolved, which was a big relief. Cause I was really tearing my hair out about that one about, you know, why isn't this working? I will say we did have one open major shooter with ammo that chronoed sub major. So his, his ammo chronoed around 155. However, he was shooting certified Ely 38 super. And so by follow, we followed the certified ammo procedure to the letter and his delivery sample matched the sample that we took off him during the match. And so he was allowed to shoot major scoring even though his he only had 155 power factor ammo because it was it was Ely certified and I mean you know I feel for the guy he he said hey I don't you know I don't load this stuff I I I just I buy it and I expect it to work and so I certainly you know it would have really sucked to be him and have bought this factor ammo that claims to be major power factor and have gone minor at Chrono but I definitely think it's it's one of these things where for the certified program to actually mean anything these manufacturers that are that are shipping certified ammo that doesn't meet the power factor it, it needs to be enforced and sure enough I, I mean i so we had three people come through with certified ammo there was that one guy with the 38 super ely that that went sub major and apparently some people at nationals a week or two before had the same issue there were a number of people who who got major scoring despite chronoing minor ammo uh so we had the one guy shooting the ely and then two guys shooting certified syntec federal syntec and that stuff honestly it's kind of it's a 150 grain bullet, but it ends up chronoing at 140 power factor. It's not especially soft for being such a heavy bullet, which kind of perplexes me. But uh, those those two, no issues. And I submitted all three of those chrono forms to Troy as as instructed by uh, the range master. And he said, you know, he would he would pass that along to Ely and, you know, who knows what they'll do with it. But if the certified ammo program is, is going to mean anything, then, then that stuff has got to stop because, you know, otherwise... Why would you not just buy the ammo that you know is softer than everyone else's and just shoot that because you get major scoring without shooting major ammo? So I, I think the whole certified ammo program is is bizarre and never should have happened, but it's on the books, so we follow the procedure to the letter. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is one of those cases where if this becomes a pattern, I think you get some real credibility problems for, for what does power factor mean? I mean, maybe this is why matches aren't running chrono as much because anybody with real sense is just buying certified ammo. So no matter what their ammo chrono is at, they, they get to shoot their declared power factor. I know that's a little cynical, but it, it, it does make you scratch your head sometimes. Uh, as for gauging the magazines, um, we just we ask the competitor, you know, as as the chrono appendix recommends, we just ask them for the longest mag they were using in the match Obviously, they are not obligated. If someone wanted to use some some mag that they knew held one more round than all the others, they wouldn't give us that one to gauge. I don't really know of... of there, there wasn't a really straightforward way to fix this. I mean, I know, for example, the World Pistol Shootout, I believe, from what I heard and saw, 
they had an equipment check when you at registration, and at that point they would gauge all your mags and put some kind of sticker on the mags that were known to pass the gauge. And I assume the stickers were difficult to remove or transfer to some other magazine. Uh, I guess you'd probably put it on the base pad because otherwise, or I don't know. Yeah, you could always mix and match base pads and tubes. So where do you put the sticker? That's an interesting question. But the idea there being if you use any mag that doesn't have the sticker on it, then you're using a mag that didn't go through equipment check. So that that should get you in trouble if the RO notices it during the stage. I've also, I mean, the idea has also occurred to me that uh, you could just have any mag that hits the ground during a stage, the RO just picks it up. You know, you can, if it's, if it's got a couple rounds shot out of it, you don't necessarily need to empty it, but if you did want to empty it, you could, and then you just gauge the mag and just, Hey, make sure it fits and hand it back to the competitor when they're done. That way, what you're gauging is what they're actually using on the range, not necessarily what they bring with them to chrono, but these, again, this is going pretty far down the, the, the cat and mouse game rabbit hole. So we didn't worry too much about that. It's just whatever mag they brought with them to, to Chrono got gauged, and there there weren't any real significant issues. There were a few folks with TTI base pads that it seemed like had some tolerance stacking issue uh, with, I think it was 320 mags, so 320 tubes and TTI base pads. Uh, so we did have, I think, two guys go to open for that, but I think they were both on staff day. I don't think during the match we had uh, we had anybody that, that got bumped to, to open for magazines. We did, so one other thing that we did change this year was having CROs on their first stage do, we asked them to, again, I wasn't there, so I can't actually verify which stages necessarily did this and, and to what level of rigor, but the idea was at the beginning of each of the three schedules, so Saturday AM, Saturday PM, and, and Sunday, the, the CRO on each stage should do an equipment check for each competitor on their, on their stage, and the idea is catch things on the first stage if they can be caught easily. Now, there's an issue there in terms of not every CRO. I mean, they, they don't, we don't necessarily cover doing equipment check really thoroughly. I know it's, I don't think it's really covered on the, the exam very much. So at, at Chrono, we also did an equipment check on every single person and we got pretty good at it and we got a pretty good, you know, rhythm to, to do it. And we only caught a few people there was one guy who was way out of compliance. Uh, he he had a, a holster that it had spacers that were like twice twice as long as as they would need to be to uh, to be. I think he was in carry optics or production to to be compliant for that. And so I, I don't know how the obviously that didn't get caught on his first stage and it was way out. But there were definitely I know there were some folks who who did get checked and and again. Ideally, that that's the way you would want to run it is you do that first cursory check. And then when they come through chrono, it's easy enough just to do a, a sort of secondary check, make sure nothing is moved or anything over the course of the day, if they took their belt off for lunch, anything like that. So having having those two layers of checks would be good. Definitely last year, it was kind of awkward where we had a few folks come through at and chrono was on their last stage of the day and they failed equipment check, but there really wasn't anything we could do about it at the time because potentially the the remedy in the rules is well they can't shoot another stage but they already shot all their stages so it was it was kind of this weird contradiction so definitely following the rule book recommendation of just checking each shooter for their first stage is, is the way to go and we did have aside from that one guy who just went to open and it was just the end of that his, his buddies were actually trying to give him some spacers and help him fix it but he was like nah don't worry about it um his he was he, i guess he was having a a kind of a crap match anyway. And he, he just, he just took the bump to open, but there were maybe four or five folks that, that we did have to tell, tell them, Hey, go to the safe area and fix it. And, and here's, you know, here's the distance that you need to close to get back into compliance before you can shoot your next stage. And one thing that coming out of last year that I spent some time tinkering with, that definitely came in handy this year is particularly for carry optics and production where you have, in, in most cases, the guys where their gun is far away from the belt, potentially not legal distance, a lot of times they also have it dropped pretty far down. And so, you know, you'll see this, I think, in my mind, the two main offenders are the, the Black Scorpion gear holsters, which often come with these giant offset blocks, where if you combine that with a, like a Red Hill Tactical that has a, a pretty big dish out where the holster mounts, you, you can pretty quickly get an out-of-compliance holster. 
And then guys who get some of the ultra adjustable stuff like the the new Henning T1000 and just don't really understand how to adjust it to be compliant. So it's not really, in that case, it's not really the fault of the holster. It's just, it it's with great power comes great responsibility type of thing. So in both of those cases, we had a number of folks come through where it was, it was a little tough, you know, last year and, and this year, it was a little tough to really double check because the, where the gun potentially would be touching the overlay was below the level of the belt. So you couldn't quite get the overlay down into it. And that got me thinking. And, and so one of the things that I did was just take an overlay and just cut a notch out of it. Uh, basically if you, you know, you think of the overlay as, as in like quarters, just basically cut a quarter out of one corner of the overlay. And basically what that let you do is you could have the overlay where this notch was cut out, touching the inside of the top of the belt, but then you had a little bit of the, the overlay that drops down below the belt, and there you can kind of sweep it around, and you can feel, hey, is this making contact with the gun? And A, for actually checking folks where it was a little questionable, it made it really easy, because either you feel the contact or you don't. And for the people who were out of compliance, it actually helped them visualize, hey, this is the distance that you need to close. You need to go to the safe area, and, and the gun needs to come in this amount. Whereas in... Last year, it was it was a little more tricky trying to kind of help them visualize, okay, I'm holding it here, but kind of imaginarily trace this line down two inches to where it would touch your gun hypothetically. It, just having this little overlay with just a, a corner notched out of it, it, it made checking quicker and easier, and it helped the competitors that were out of compliance. It helped them see exactly what they needed to do. So uh, I'll just keep that one... I. I I, I remember I tried cutting it with like a box cutter and I mean, they're, you know, the, the plastic on those is decently thick. I think I ended up cutting it with just a Dremel tool or something like that. But yeah, I would say it, it, all of us have a stack of overlays because you get two of them every year that you're a certified RO. So I just went into my box and grabbed one and, and cut it up and stuck it in my, in my uh, little range wallet where I keep the, the overlays and, you know, other, other range membership cards and all that. And so I just, I just had it this year and and it worked perfectly. And so I'll just have it in, in future years. But yeah, I would definitely recommend if you want to be able to really kind of quickly and easily just check less by sight and more by feel, right? Because you can sort of feel when the when this overlay with the notch comes out, you can feel, okay, is it scraping against the gun making contact or not? So it, it makes it much quicker to, to check. And then, it, like I said, if there's a compliance issue, the competitor can see what they need to do. And so just to kind of close the loop, the, the, we would do the equipment check at the end. So once the, the gun had made power factor, we'd shot enough rounds. We were satisfied that we didn't need to shoot any extras to, to make power factor. The, my, the guy in the, the right seat would, uh, unload the gun, set it on the mat and then tell the competitor to, to step up. We would both stand up and look at him and then tell the competitor to unload and show clear. Once he was clear, just stand right where he was. Uh, we did have some issues on staff day where folks brought the guns up bagged or something and we had to get them to actually holster it so we could do equipment check, but pretty pretty minor stuff like that. But once the gun was holstered, the guy on the right seat, you know, the, the person who was shooting would check the gun. I was on the left side and I would just check that the, the mag pouches were good to go, which we did have a few that were a little bit dicey, but nobody that was that was so far out that it was uh that that they had to adjust their mag pouches but you basically had you know ro on one side checking the gun i was on the other side checking the the mag pouches we basically you know gun is a pass mag pouches are a pass mark it a pass in the tablet have them hit approve give them their bullets and and roll out of there and i mean if i do say so myself especially by by the end of the day sunday we we had it down it was it was a pretty good rhythm the the only occasional hiccups were the the bullets that wouldn't easily pull out with the collet puller. And even then it just was an extra 15, 20 seconds to just load it in the, the pile driver and, and get it out that way. And typically the, the guy handling the gun was doing the, the gun safety checks and all that anyway. And so, yeah, it, it was, it was about as good as, uh, as we can get. I don't really have a, a huge number of notes on, on things to improve, especially once we got the issue figured out with the open guns with the, the dual lab radar setup. So really my, my goal coming out of this one is just document what we did. And then, you know, if there is anything to improve or, you know, if you were there and something, you saw something that, that could be better, definitely let me know. I mean, I, I want to improve, but uh, from, from my perspective, I think things went about as smoothly as they could. And I'm, I'm really happy with how things went that, that people seem to come knowing that, that they were going to be checked thoroughly and, and everybody seemed to appreciate it. You know, we weren't, 
we weren't trying to jam anyone up or slow anyone's match down, just have a real quick, efficient check, just make sure everybody was playing by the by the same rules and get people on with their match. And uh, again, it's it's a weird thing to, I don't want to become known as like the, you know, obsessed about Chrono guy because, you know, I've, I've only done it two years now, but it, it's been interesting to kind of go deep into this one topic, try and optimize it, do it the best we can, and, you know, hopefully set a pattern that, that other folks can run with in, in the future. So it doesn't always have to be me. And obviously anybody listening to this, you know, is welcome to to take ideas, send me an email. If you have any questions, if you want to me to elaborate on anything, I'm, I'm happy to share what we know, but yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's about all I got. And, and this one's already going on way, way too long. So I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up there, but yeah, I'm really happy with how things went and hopefully next year it'll be equally as smooth. Well, that wraps up this episode of Short Course. If you want to get in touch with me, my email is ben at barryshooting.com. Talk to you next time.